Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. Love, love, love this company. You'll be hearing all about them later from me later in the episode. But now, on with the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, I'm joined by Sid Powell of Maple Finance. Sid, welcome to the show. Hey, Mike. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, absolutely. Um, So let's get right into it. You were operating in this really interesting space, right, that there's a lot of focus on both within the crypto space and also more broadly macro finance in general, which is specifically credit within crypto. Um, So maybe we can just start from like a 10,000 foot view. Uh, There have been a lot of news stories recently, specifically focused on some of the more uh, CFI lenders in the space, kind of, uh, you know, like the Celsius blow up, right? There's some stress on BlockFi, that type of stuff. Can you talk a little bit about just like the credit space in general in crypto and also a little bit about what what Maple does as well would be great? Yeah, sure. So the credit, I mean, the credit space in crypto is largely, largely takes place in both uh, CFI businesses. So these would include uh, players like Genesis, BlockFi. Um, you know, it was uh, Celsius. Uh, uh, you know, prior to uh, prior to a few weeks ago. And then there's the DeFi space, which is Aave, Compound, uh, Maker, uh, Maple, TrueFi, uh, Goldfinch, and others. And so what mm. we're seeing though is across the board. So uh, crypto crypto lending collectively is being constrained at the moment. So what we've seen is liquidity has largely been pulled from the system. And that has meant there is less capital available to be deployed to loans. So what you've seen is a deleveraging where the amount that borrowers had as loans has uh, has come down. Um, and then you've seen deposits be withdrawn from lending platforms in the DeFi space like Maple, as well as in the CFI, mm-hmm. you know, in the CFI space, uh, withdrawals from, uh, you know, lenders like BlockFi and Voyager and others. And so this is largely being driven at the moment by fears of contagion. You know, we saw 3AC uh, blow up and then there were concerns around who had counterparty exposures to them. Um, And that has, you know, that has kind of rippled throughout the market. And uh, people are broadly adopting a risk off posture. So it's, it's kind of like normally you could have liquidity provided into the system if the price was right, i.e. if borrowers are willing to pay the right interest rate. We've certainly seen that interest rate go up. But what we've found is that people are highly risk off such that they don't really consider that there is a right price at which they would go and deposit back into the market and in mm. you know clear loans. And so that's like that's uh, problematic for long term lending because you need like you need credit for businesses to continue operating um, and particularly in uh, in. Yeah, particularly in crypto, where a lot of it, you know, a lot of uh, the kind of the health of the ecosystem functions on liquidity being available, uh, you know, both on centralized exchanges and and in the DeFi space. Yeah. So I think maybe if we can talk about, um, you know, root causes here and why does the situation look so different than it did over the last six months? Obviously, there's a large macro overhang uh, and kind of things outside of crypto. We see central banks hiking interest rates and pulling liquidity out of markets via QT, which is probably trickling into our ecosystem a little bit. Um, And then there are some more specific blow ups, right? Like you mentioned Celsius and you mentioned Three Arrows Capital. I, I think many folks who are listeners will be familiar with with 3AC, but for maybe some of the people who aren't as deeply embedded in crypto, can you just describe a little bit about uh, who 3AC, 3 Arrows Capital was and why this explosion was so significant, particularly for some of the, the lenders in the space? Yeah, so 3AC, uh, 3AC was a very large uh, hedge fund. And so mm-hmm. they, they were trading a lot of different assets and with a lot of different counterparties. And so, um, you know, they had a multi-billion dollar balance sheet which, uh, you know, and and very strong relationships and a strong reputation in the space that enabled them to borrow on fairly, um, you know, fairly favorable terms for themselves. And then what happened was, uh, you know, basically they were trading directionally and they got Mm. caught in some wrong way trades. And then as the and given their leverage, as the market moved against them, that meant, you know, effectively, you know, an accelerating erosion of their equity. And then more problematically, they started to source other people's funds um, for, you know, directional trading purposes and to cover collateral. So this meant that they ended up, you know, at the time that people stopped lending to them, uh, they ended up with, you know, large negative equity positions and some of their counterparties who were lenders took a loss. Now, we at, at Maple um, or, you know, the pool delegates running pools on Maple were never lending to them. Um, but uh, given their size and how, you know, how well connected they were in the space, um, 
you know, they they really kicked off a lot of these contagion fears. And we've seen that, you know, that there have been some of the large CFI lending desks who have recognized losses on those positions. And, uh, you know, other other people are still waiting to kind of see how the uh, how the contagion effect plays out. But, you know, it does kind of point to one of the issues, which is between CFI and DeFi lending that, you know, in DeFi lending, you can see who the counterparties are. And that kind of prevents sudden disclosures that, you know, this this counterparty was a hugely significant part of our book uh, or, you know, we've suddenly suffered a loss trade, you know, lending to one of these counterparties like that is something where, um, you know, having a transparent flow of funds and, and kind of, um, you know, recorded loan book uh, on chain does provide some risk mitigation there. So what you're you know kind of referring to there and one of the problems associated with three arrows and many hedge funds before is this idea of contagion, right? Which, yeah. uh, you know, there's that ongoing joke in crypto that we keep rediscovering concepts from TradFi. Well, contagion's yeah. a big one, uh, you know, yeah. uh, like you and I were talking about the story of long-term capital uh, before we got on here and sent some yeah. of kind of the comparisons, but they were huge hedge funds in, in, in the 90s. And I can see why people are making the comparison because, you know, they were all, they were really the original smartest guys in the room, right? They had like black, yeah. black, black shoals, right? No. Well, one, prize of, one, winners, one, of, one of the co-discoverers over it, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Like, so they were the, the genius, right? Smartest guys in the room. And, you know, um, everyone was basically fighting hand over fist to basically, uh, you know, fund their trades, right? And they had a bunch of different arbitrage strategy, but they're basically running convergence trades at size. Um, and people didn't realize they had like $4 billion of equity capital, uh, but they borrowed like $100 billion or something like that. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, right, when the trades started to go against them, all the banks realized that they all have the same biggest customer, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, I feel like that's sort of what's happening in, uh, you know, maybe in, in some of the more CFI lending parts of the space. Walk me through how DeFi is kind of an evolution on that. Like, how does the transparency that uh, DeFi and like lending that goes on on chain, how does that improve, right? And maybe avoid some of these contagion risks in the future? It's, it, it's a good point. And, you know, with, with long-term capital management, I mean, there are parallels and similarities to what happened with Archegos, uh, where you had, yeah, you know, right. effectively leverage was enabled by borrowing significant amounts from prime brokerages. And it was done through derivatives like swaps. Uh, but what it enabled was massive leverage such that an ordinary trade that wouldn't pay a significant amount, if you did it with 100x leverage, you were able to deliver a real, really significant return on equity. Um, you know, with with 3AC, I mean, there, there was obviously significant leverage and directional trading there. So I would say a lot of the a lot of the larger under or uncollateralized borrowers in the crypto space are typically market makers uh, or delta neutral. So they're they're providing the service of liquidity on centralized exchanges rather than taking direction expressing directional views through leverage. Um, but I think you know importantly, one of the reasons that uh, you know the 3AC blow up. Um, you know, triggers contagion concerns is that they are borrowing from multiple counterparties, but uh, it was not clear looking from the outside how large the exposure was to any individual lending desk and therefore what the size of the loss would be, you know, and and nor how much of the loan book, you know, 3AC took up. Whereas I think when you look at DeFi lending, what you can see and, you know, to talk our own book on Maple, you can see who all of the borrowers are in the pools. So you can never have a situation where you suddenly wake up one day and find that actually this pool was lending unbeknownst to you 50% of it, you know, 50% of its deposits to a singular, you know, a singular counterparty that you weren't aware of. Um, so I think this, you know, moving away from Maple and, and back to DeFi, you know, the, the advantage here is by having a transparent flow of funds, you can always effectively see, you know, proof, proof of assets in lending businesses, because you could look at a pool, you can see how much cash is there. You can see all of the addresses that are borrowing, and if you look at the front end, you can see who you know. You can see who those addresses are linked to. Uh, but you can also the other the other element that people are often concerned about is you know the discretion around say freezing or pausing withdrawals. And when that's governed mm-hmm. by a smart contract, you can see you know that that is not possible, and that you know the, effectively the, the the protocol functions in either a more automated or, or decentralized way, depending on how you characterize it. But there is no discretionary element where, you know, a, like may, someone at Maple can wake up tomorrow and go, okay, we're, we're pausing all withdrawals. And then the third element, and, and it's the same, you know, same for Aave, like Aave, Aave and Compound um, and these other platforms are not going to, at their discretion, pause withdrawals. And then the third element to, to think about is that, you effectively have a kind of proof of, you know, proof of reserves. So, 
in uh, in Aave, you have the safety module. Um, in Maple, each pool has its own reserve, um, which is available to to kind of cover you know credit losses up to a certain limit. So you always have this kind of proof of what is the subordinate or what is you know effectively the equity or first loss capital sitting underneath that lending business, which you're not going to know when you are participating on on a on a CFI or, or a TradFi lending business. Walk me through, uh, like one thing that I that I think about a lot, right, is, you know, when people kind of think of central banks right now, like the Federal Reserve, mm. uh, you know, there's this meme, money printer go burr, and they're exacerbating yeah. income inequality and like all this stuff. We talk about a lot on this show. But, you know, if you go back to 1913 and the original creation uh, of the Fed, the reason why it's, it's the lender of last resort, right? Like they're there to essentially be the bank for banks and to provide liquidity mm-hmm. at a time uh, when, when it's in dire need, when right? people are basically panicking. Um, so, you know, I would get uh, my head put on a spike if I suggested on, on this podcast that we need some sort of Fed, right, for for, for crypto. Yeah. But uh, I think what you guys are doing, and like, I think the, the powerful message and one of my takeaways from Maple and frankly, other DeFi lenders is like, you can't just arbitrarily withdraw funds or uh, so, uh, mm. stop uh, users from being able to take their funds out. But what's the other side of that equation, right? Because if everyone panics and withdraws their fund at the same time, like that's also an issue. So how do you kind of think about, like even right now, we're kind of seeing people panic and take their funds out of centralized lenders. So like, how do we get out of these um, like liquidity crunches? Because that's kind of the problem right now where people are panicking, no one's extending credit. Like how do we stop the the vicious cycle and turn it back into a, a virtuous cycle? Yeah. A- a liquidity, like a liquidity crisis on some of those platforms, can turn into a solvency crisis if they're unable to unwind positions without incurring a loss. You know, like if you'd had mm-hmm. to, you were seeing this the other week with Steve. But if you had to unwind a position in, in Steve, ordinarily it used to trade at par, but if you had to unwind it in a pinch, you were you were going to liquidate that at a loss to get back to to ETH. Right. And so that's where sudden liquidity withdrawals can can actually create a solvency issue because then you were taking taking a loss on it. Um, but you know, you're quite right, Michael. Like what we've heard is that there needs to be a lender of last resort. You, we've kind of seen um, that concept almost, you know, almost emerge with FTX and Alameda providing lines of credit to some of the centralized lending desks. Um, and what that does is it's more of a psychological self. So it gives people, you know, people have confidence in the rescuing balance sheet. And so they're less inclined to go and withdraw from those platforms, which actually creates, you know, um, like a, a it breaks the negatively reinforced feedback loop um, by giving people a confidence to leave their deposits in those platforms. Um, I suppose the, the criticism that um, DeFi has leveled at the space is, you know, could we rebuild, a, if we're trying to rebuild a financial system or improve upon a financial system, could we do away with the need for having this lender of last resort by just having, you know, controls or transparency around withdrawal mechanisms um, so that you don't end up with large asset liability mismatches, which is fundamentally yeah. what causes what causes this uh, the possibility of a run on the bank. People deposit into a bank. A bank goes and originates twenty five year mortgages, and then that's the foundation. You know, that's a, a huge foundation foundational element for the modern financial system. And so, it's so important that the government backstops those deposits. Um, in DeFi, we don't have, you know, we we don't have a public lender of last resort. Um, and so you've seen a very strong private balance sheet step in, but it creates systemic risk in that if everybody is dependent on this one party providing backstop credit, it's like AIG. So everybody had insurance on mortgage securities during the GFC, except they all had it with AIG. And then they all defaulted at the same time and AIG's balance sheet couldn't cover it. Um, yeah. And I think what we're trying to do, what I would suggest here is like, one, could we move away from the concept of a single party who's too big to fail? And one of the ways you can do this is by having a lot of smaller lenders who don't have contagion risk. How we're trying to do that on Maple is by having distinct non-commingled pools where you can transparently see the reserves. Each pool has its own reserve and isn't, re- yeah. isn't reliant on a single lender of last resort. Where we've, where we've had issues has been asset liability mismatch in that loans need to be repaid for people to withdraw. So in that respect, it's a little closer to like private credit funds where people would typically have longer lockups and um, restrictions on withdrawals than it is to banks where you have an at call deposit. Um, but uh, I think what you do need in the space is some kind of tenor on withdrawals or deposits so that you can actually give predictable credit to businesses, which they need to, you know, they need to run operations. 100%. As a consumer of financial products in crypto, I can tell you firsthand, 
there it's very uh there's a lot of greenfield opportunities right um and i've heard you say on other podcasts that it's like even really like large uh you know crypto native businesses right uh the traditional banking system sometimes treats treats them like they're guns or alcohol or or uh you know uh firearms alcohol and firearms. whatever it is uh tobacco yeah yeah, yeah. Tobacco. Yeah, man. It's like you get blacklisted. Um, so uh, yeah, I think there's like an enormous, uh, opportunity, right. For, for, um, some more well, that unwillingness solution. of the traditional financial system to come and engage in this space is going to force, you know, crypto and DeFi lending to evolve its own protective mechanisms, um, which, you know, hopefully should make it stronger because we develop a way to avoid or mitigate bank runs, um, either through transparency, locks on you know locks on on withdrawals um or rather deposit depositing at tenor um with clarity around withdrawal mechanisms and you know having having an on-chain proof of reserves well one thing like volatility is no fun to endure right it's no fun to endure as an investor and as i'm sure you could probably attest to as, <laughs> as an operator it also poses its challenges but what volatility yeah. does is it breeds resiliency in general, yeah. right? Um, so I think I think you could make a really solid argument that right. Everyone's right now taking victory laps about what's going on in crypto. Oh, look, they're down seventy yeah. percent. Yada yada. What would happen if the S and P fell seventy <laughs> percent? How much shit would break in TradFi comparatively? I think things are functioning actually pretty well, honestly. Yeah. Uh, in our well, space, I mean, given the, the amount of volatility. Well, you know what happens if if it trades down? You know beyond a single i think it's like a five or five or six percent in a single day they shut down the exchange so they, they right. get withdrawals on a daily basis if uh, if yeah. that happens and that that fail safe has been used before but it's it's used to break up liquidity exits because when liquidity exits a system too fast it create you know it creates contagion and a liquidity crisis can lead to a solvency crisis if it um if it becomes prolonged or exacerbated um but I, uh, I definitely, yeah, I definitely agree with the point around, you know, volatility can breed inventive solutions. And I think, yeah. uh, you know, one of one of the things I've also heard the last few days is that under collateralized lending is dead and that everyone should go to over collateralized lending. If we think about a financial system that is entirely over collateralized lending, that would mean that all of and particularly over collateralized lending against liquid financial assets, then that would mean you either had to have invested in some kind of token that 100x to be able to borrow or in future you had to have to be like the the child or grandchild of somebody who did that so that you can borrow against their stack of collateral which is a totally broken financial system by the way exactly right if you literally play i, I was going to say the same thing as you which is like well first of all if the collateral that you're using to over collateralize stuff is something that went from you know one dollar to 200 in the last year right we're looking yeah. at i know people six months ago didn't think that that could fall but yeah, it can fall more than 50%, yeah. right? But the real problem yeah. with it is that's centralizing, right? It's kind of ironic yes. people advocating for, uh, you know, a, a decentralized, you know, currency, but then like advocating for only a system where you can over collateralize loans because yeah, then you have to start with assets, then you can get more. It's a centralizing. Yeah, let, know, let, 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 yeah. I mean, pl playing it out, like a lot of a lot of people criticize the sophisticated investor laws where you got to have, you know, I forget if it's over 200K in, in annual income or over $5 million in net assets, but if you think about playing out a, an entirely over collateralized lending system, that's basically what you end up with. The only people who can borrow are those who have very, very significant um, net worths such that they can put down the amount of collateral required to borrow. Most of the financial system and most of business in general actually functions on either unsecured, uncollateralized um, or you know, just secured by the balance sheet. Um, of, uh, of a corporate entity. You know, if you run a lemonade stand and somebody delivers you lemons and you pay for them 30 days later, that's credit. Like that's not over, that's not an over collateralized loan. That is um, under collateralized lending uh, right there. But I think, um, you know, so I think under collateralized lending definitely comes with risk, but those risks are fairly transparent. It's the credit risk of a counterparty. And there are ways that you can mitigate that in running a prudent lending business, diversification, adequate reserves, um, you know, due diligence on counterparties using things like X margin, where you can tell the health of a balance sheet and the exposure on exchanges. Um, but I think, you know, like this point in the market when everyone is maximum pessimistic on under collateralized lending, like this is under collateralized lending is what's required for DeFi to actually consume the financial system. Because otherwise you went, yeah. Otherwise you end up with a system where you have lending products that are not actually improving upon anything that's done in TradFi. And mm -hmm. also, 
One other, one other point to note is that, you know, a lot of people talk about real world assets coming on chain for lending. So real world assets don't protect you from defaults or give you a liquid recourse. It takes 18 months to go and foreclose on a house and get the proceeds of that if somebody defaults. So real world assets are also largely illiquid. So you end up with the problem. It's like lending against Steeth or something, right? Where you have this illiquid asset that you can't actually unwind. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's... It, yeah, it's, it, it is a more nuanced take, but I would say, you know, calls calls that under collateralized lending is is dead or are definitely premature. A hundred percent. I feel like a, any a good area to play is one that you know from a first principle standpoint has to exist, but one that people are max bearish on at any given point of time, right? Like there's a long history of this, right? Like people loving debt, hating debt, loving debt, hating yeah. debt. And if you go back to you know the founding of the United States, Alexander Hamilton right? That he advocated for a national bank. He proposed this like really controversial idea that some amount of debt, a manageable amount of debt was good. Now you can argue like we've taken that mm. idea maybe to a little bit of excess in the current day, but like, come on, yeah. man. I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely, I would say a good thing. Um, yeah. Historically, like if you, if you read the, I mean, if you read the Sapiens book, um, the author talks about, you know, one of the pivotal shifts historically um, in, uh, in, you know, technology and economic development was actually the advocacy of debt, you know, prior to, you know, prior to the Renaissance and, and um, the Reformation, uh, people viewed the pie as fixed. And therefore, any debt was effectively increasing your slice of the pie at the expense of my slice. But it was only when you had this idea that the pie could grow. And effectively, if, if debt is done correctly, then I am lending to a business that will become a more profitable business and a larger business in future, because they prudently use debt and they combine that with entrepreneur, their, you know, their own um, entrepreneurship and hard work to build a more successful business that can pay back that debt in future. And, um, you know, so I think that's a, that's a profoundly kind of optimistic belief. Okay. I have an optimistic belief or narrative for you. Tell me if I'm, <laughs> uh, if I, you agree here or not, but one thing that I, I, I view, uh, a big change in just the banking system in America over the last like 80 years, and you can go back and see this in the data is just mm -hmm. consolidation in general and mm -hmm. kind of the death of the regional bank, right? Like if you go back and watch, movies from like the 1950, like it's a wonderful life or whatever. I know there were bank runs back then, but you, yeah, you can yeah. look at what people's mental image of a bank was, right? You had a friendly neighborhood banker and they served the community. They gave loans to people. And over time, right through various financial crises, the response of regulators largely has been to consolidate to when you have bad debt that gets overextended, you put it on a bigger balance sheet and then you eventually just keep rolling it up to the point where mm -hmm. we now basically have what in the US? Like six or eight mega banks, uh, right? Yeah. And one of one of the um, results of that has been that small businesses do not get served anymore. And that's not because banks mm -hmm. are evil, it's just basic business sense because they have much larger customers and they make their fees largely now by rolling debt of huge corporations, right? Like Apple and Amazon, et cetera. So that's how they get their fees. Why would they extend credit to someone like Blockworks, right? Like it's just, it just it doesn't move the needle for them. I feel like yeah. that's an opportunity for DeFi in general. Am I being overly optimistic there? Do you agree with that assessment? But it seems like it's a large market that's been largely forgotten because of this weird consolidation effect that's gone on in banking in the US. Yeah, I mean, at, at, at a, so at an industry level, you're absolutely right. Uh, banking has been consolidated and partly partly that is due to, you know, when, when you end up with um, an institution that's holding bad assets, um, uh, then they get consolidated into a larger institution. So a lot of what happened during the mm. GFC or in the wake of the GFC was that two like a, a weaker institution would get merged or rolled into a stronger institution. But right. this is going to happen naturally if your goal is to reduce that volatility. Um, because what happens is, so you've got a bell, bell curve of volatile, volatile outcomes, right? And so you have um, institutions that would fail at, you know, two standard deviations of volatility. So then they get combined. Then it becomes an institution that gets, mm -hmm. uh, becomes insolvent at three or four standard deviations of volatility. But over a long enough time horizon, you will experience that once or twice. And if you don't actually allow the kind of the bad to be um, worked out of the system, then you have to consolidate them again. And you've now ended up at the point where there is a single digit number of large commercial banks, because mm. we, we, you know, we went through over time enough very volatile events. And if you play that out in crypto, what happens is that you had a few centralized lending desks. Um, some of them have gone under, some of them may be merged. You know, if you had one that has survived, buy out the assets of say a Celsius um, or a Voyager or another one, you end up with industry consolidation. 
And then if we play that out, if we look ahead another 10 years, we'll probably have another very volatile event. And then you might uh, consolidate the remaining ones into one or two extremely large lenders. Now that would yeah. reduce, it would prevent, you know, the bad credit being worked out of the system at the time, and it would create a more stable system, but it creates one that's also exposed to systemic failure in that you eventually get to this, you know, market monopoly type position or oligopoly type position. Whereas I think what we're trying to do is create the infrastructure to have many smaller, non-systemically important lending institutions at play here. Yeah. Walk, walk me through um, almost as like, uh, if you could do like a credit product roadmap for crypto, right? Over the next like five years, right? Both at Maple, but like also broadly, right? Like yeah. where is the, you know, where's the demand for borrow coming today? And how do you think it might evolve over the course of the next three, five, however far you want to go out? Just walk me through kind of your vision of the, the future. Yeah, sure. So, the, I mean, the crypto market in terms of um, in terms of breadth and variety of operating institutions is still relatively undeveloped. So um, currently you've got kind of two sectors that furnish the main borrowing within crypto. So you've got market makers and high frequency traders. So people doing arbitrage who would borrow uncollateralized and then go and, go and provide liquidity and trading pairs on centralized exchanges. So that's one. And then you've got, uh, you know, Bitcoin miners where the other people who access debt, debt capital markets from within crypto. Mm. They found equity markets are kind of closed. And so they're looking to borrow again. A lot of them have large, um, you know, large deliveries of ASICs that will increase their capacity and they need to get to scale at Bitcoin at these prices. Um, and so that's that's the other sector. But you can see that the borrowers still remain largely like within crypto. On the horizon, you've got other industries. So we're trying to target Bitcoin miners next, but you've got other industries like potentially infrastructure. So this could be players like Blockdaemon, like Figment, like Chorus, who have recurring sticky cash flows that it's possible to underwrite. In uh, a TradFi equivalent would be having um, you know an infrastructure like a poles and wires type company or um, cell phone towers. Like you might be able to lever up the assets of these companies because they have recurring cash flows and it makes more sense. Then, on the in terms of the roadmap, you then need to look at um, larger markets like potentially real world assets or non crypto native industries. So this could be real estate would be an interesting one. SaaS companies will probably converge on crypto. Like I know that Pipe and some of the other lending companies that offer uh, working capital loans are starting to look at crypto miners. And since they've already done SaaS companies, I think there's going to be a natural convergence there. So there's an opportunity to go and lend. Um, to uh, to the SaaS sector. And I think they're going to be early on in being able to actually adopt and use crypto. A key dependency there is you need good on and off ramps. So I think that is something that's needed for the crypto lending roadmap to evolve and serve a wider addressable market. But it needs to serve industries and borrowers outside of regular, you know, regular crypto, um, crypto sectors like trading firms and, and uh, you know, proof of work miners, because um, otherwise it's too leveraged to that kind of, um, you know, that, that kind of crypt crypto cycle, so to speak. Yeah. Could you walk uh, me through a little bit? I, I've been hearing I, a little one, bit about like, I, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, Mike, one, one of the things to add on is like I, I, another criticism I've also seen leveled at the space recently has been that, you know, everyone said that uh, crypto was inventing a better way to uh, detect uh, credit worthiness. And I would say, I think that I think that's actually a misnomer. And actually what crypto is doing is it is a better way of managing and settling and originating loan books and taking in deposits, you know, taking in and managing deposits and payments from the loans to those deposits. So it's really like crypto and uh, blockchain and smart contracts actually eliminate a huge proportion of the headcount at a credit fund or a lending business, which is just back office functions. It's not better determination of credit. It is better origination and management of loans. And I think that's why crypto will ultimately eat finance and why it's important that crypto still has under collateralized lending. This episode is brought to you by Fireblocks. I talk to a lot of fast growing crypto native funds, crypto banks, exchanges and the like, and they all tell me they have the same two problems. One, their treasury management setup sucks. They've got analysts wasting time and money on manual transactions. Two, they are not happy with their current security setup. They're sharing passwords, they're sending test transactions, and they're worried that their funds might be at risk. Fireblocks is a platform that solves all of that for you. They're a one-stop shop portal, which automatically plugs into exchanges, 
trading venues, etc. They source deep liquidity and solve everything from day-to-day -day crypto transactions all the way down to complex DeFi strategy. And the best thing about Fireblocks is that they offer scalable solutions with industry-leading technology. Doesn't matter if you're a two-person crypto fund or a 2,000-person crypto exchange, these guys have you covered. And the last thing that I'll say about this company is that I have known them for years. They are a high integrity team. They ship product like no other. I would trust them with my own funds. So click the link at the bottom of this page and tell them that I sent you. Very, very important that you click the link at the bottom here. Otherwise, they're not going to know that I sent you. And then how am I going to get credit? So help a brother out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Tell them I sent you. Okay. Two-part follow-up question to that. One, can you explain the, the, the analog of what the origination and credit management process looks like in TradFi today? And then two, I want to make sure we get back to that. Um, like, do you think that crypto needs some sort of on-chain identity, right? As like almost like an on-chain, I've heard you say ratings agency, but even if you're a consumer, yeah. like some sort of on-chain credit score, something like that. Because I think in crypto, we are bumping into this of like, where are the logical limits of anonymity, right? Like we, this isn't a lending example, but like, yeah with uh you know sifu right and and like ooh, like yeah, yeah. maybe maybe there are some limits to how anonymous we really want to go here you know yeah. uh so i keep to, i always ask two-part questions sorry so the first part what's the analog <laughs> what does it look like in in chat by today uh and how in yeah. this crypto improvement and then maybe we can talk about decentralized yeah. identity well yeah I, so i would say you know being able to use crypto is like having open access to the international swift system and being able to create your own derivative bank accounts from that like that's effectively mm. You can send money to any two points in the Ethereum network or, you know, choose, choose your other chain. Um, versus if you are running a TradFi lending business, you have to go and set up a bank account. Um, and then that bank account is in the name of, let's say, so you're running like a, a credit fund or a lending business. So you set up that bank account and then you have to go to your LPs and get them to deposit into that bank account. If they're doing it from overseas, they've got to go through the Swiss system. Uh, then for any loan you want, want to originate, your customer has to have their own separate bank account. And then you got to send money there, but you, you don't have visibility once it gets to the other side. Um, and you also can't actually integrate software. So you could never create, you can't really create a platform where the customer can go and access your software and just like very easily go and make that repayment. And then it gets routed back to your bank account. And then, you know, it gets interest gets distributed to your LPs or your depositors. Mm. Crypto on blockchain allows a fully integrated system where you can you can create your own bank accounts. So you're not reliant on this aging infrastructure um, that is not receiving the kind of the investment that it needs and that is very difficult to actually access. Um, you're not reliant on that to kind of run a lending business. So, um, you know, it's kind of it's a boring and sort of unsexy operational matter, but the rough equivalent is <laughs> um, owning a restaurant or running a restaurant where you actually own the land in the building and then you can make upgrades to the building uh, versus having to pay a landlord for this or having the landlord be able to up your rent as your restaurant becomes more successful. I think this is why largely a lot of other fintech businesses failed or weren't able to actually generate cost savings that they could pass on to their customers because they never controlled the infrastructure that they were built on. The restaurant example is interesting. Did you ever watch The Founder? It's, uh, it's the, it's the, the founding of McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, yeah the Ray yeah, Kroc yeah. one. I know the story. I haven't seen the movie. It's like my favorite quote ever, uh, maybe from movies, is like, you know, he after he makes McDonald's. And the, the, the point is he... He kind of steals this thing, the speedy system, which was this operational way of like quickly creating, you know, burgers. And he takes, he yeah, franchises yeah. it out, but the business is failing. And the pivotal point was actually when he finds out that McDonald's is not a restaurant business, it's a real estate business. So to your exact point, owning why, like the values in owning the land actually, and yeah. not in the restaurant that it's built on. But he has this quote after he screws the original inventors of this, the speedy system out of their their uh, their IP basically. And he says, if, if your competitor was uh, drowning or drowning on the ground, would you help them? Because I wouldn't, I'd go and stick a hose in their mouth. I'm like, oh, that's a savage move, Ray Kroc. That's a savage <laughs> quote from you. Um, uh, yeah. But yeah, yeah to, to your point, I think this is where, I mean, those analogies are, are really helpful, I think, in understanding. Because if you aren't in finance, and even most people in finance, I've learned over the years, they don't have an idea of the guts of how this is built and just exactly how archaic it is. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in many ways, right, like what, what 
Sorry, go. Yeah, you go. Explain it better than me. I was, was going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm very, no, I'm very like hugely archaic. Like I used to work at one of the largest Australian banks, right? And so if we wanted to settle a loan to an institution, I'd have to go and give an ops team two days heads up, and then you know, three pe- that that would be the work of like three people to go and make sure that that, pro- that payment was processed, uh, and you know, a chain of about thirty different emails. Whereas you can compare now, it's like with the blockchain, it's li- it, it's you can have a lending business run by a single digit number of people where you don't really require any dedicated ops staff um, because it's just a click of a button to manage all repayments. You can automate, you know, calculations and reconciliations of interest. Um, so it's, you know, it, it is a 10 X improvement on re- actually running a financing and lending business. Yeah. 100%. And, uh, you know, I do, I do think in general, like one thing that, especially in these bear markets right now when all the very, you know, the price is going down and all these convincing arguments come out about how, you know, we're not going to see new highs in crypto for 10 more years and we're heading into a great depression and all that kind of stuff. Something that always gives me, uh, you know, a certain amount of hope for this space is that the it's just an upgrade to the technology, right? So maybe that happens further in the future than you would ideally hope, but it's a pretty good North Star just in terms of you've got one system that's really outdated and doesn't work super well. And then you've got another system that is is undeniably a, a just Maybe it's not as sexy, but it's just a tech upgrade, basically. So that's the way things tend to trend. Yeah, I mean, you know, 10, 10 years ago or 15 years ago when Jeff Bezos set up uh, AWS, who would have guessed that effectively hosting Oracle servers in the cloud would have been a sexy, you know, tens of billions of dollar business a year in, in run rate revenue. And this is kind of the same thing. It's, it's kind of like hosting, hosting the back office of the entire financial system is sitting on the cloud, on the, on the blockchain. Like, I think, you know, I, th- I think there's a huge amount of value there. And um, yeah, it's kind of peak periods of peak pessimism like this is, is when everyone says it's dead. But, uh, you know, I think that's when you kind of got to lean into it. Let, let's talk about kind of, you know, I've, I've heard you describe this in, in past interviews as kind of like an on-chain ratings agency. Uh, mm. But, you know, in, in TradFi, we've got Moody's, right? And they're supposed to go and they work with the issuer of a bond that says, uh, an investment grade bond or it's high yield or whatever it is. Um, and one thing that it seems like we might be missing in crypto overall is some way to determine credit worthiness, right? Mm. Because if we go back to our three arrows example, they were largely coasting right off of their mm. reputation. And and we're not even, I'm not picking on crypto here because to your point, this has been successfully done in TradFi a million times, right? Long-term is, mm. is one example. More recently, like two years ago, Bill Wang, right, Archegos, uh, they've essentially done this, right? So this is kind of an existing yeah. problem. So do, do you think that there's some form of like on-chain credentialism, right, you know, in, in terms of determining, uh, you know, who's, who's credit worthy or not? I mean, are we, are we missing that in the system? Do you think it's unrealistic to build or how do you feel about that? Well, the, there, there's a number of projects that are working on this, like an, on, an on-chain credit score, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's Credmark or... Uh, Spectral, Teller, um, uh, X, X margins is more uh, incorporating off-chain information as well. But I think the, the barrier has been that if I look at if if I look at a business and look at its on-chain activity, I'm still missing too significant a part of its actual overall commercial activity. Like if I look at one of the major market makers, um, you know, let let let's so let's say you know GSR is a top four market maker, but if you go and look at their on-chain activity, you'll see their on-chain wallets, but you won't see the significant amount of volume that they are doing on centralized exchanges. And so, since right. um, that sector is one of the largest borrowers, having a pure on-chain credit score has not actually given me, you know, as a consumer of that score, I wouldn't have an increased ability to tell their credit worthiness. Um, I think X Margin is a hugely useful product for that. Like they are because they are looking at um, in a zero knowledge way, kind of producing a credit score that factors in trading activity and delta neutrality, equity, you know, equity buffer on um, on the centralized exchanges, as well as some of the on chain activity. So I think that kind of score is probably or that type of product, which factors in off chain and on chain information, is um, is kind of the bridge. And then if in future everyone's conducting most of their financial activity on chain, that's when you'd be able to uh, to do an on chain credit score. Interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not super technical on this. So I, I understand it would probably be a challenge, right? Like even yeah. my, like, how do you link up everyone's different wallets into your point? Yeah, like, uh, you know, off chain trading activity. It's, tough. it's not impossible to conceive of it happening in future. Like if you look at the way a FICO score works, it looks at your history of like repayments against utility bills, credit card bills, 
um, loan payments. It, it doesn't normally actually factor in income. Typically, that would be something that an underwriter of a loan of personal consumer loans looks at themselves. Um, uh, but, it, you know, a, a person's credit score also factors in things like whether they are, you know, PAYG versus self-employed. Um, so there is a ton of, you know, a ton of data points that go into that. But if everyone was conducting their activity on chain, it's not inconceivable to see a future where that, that is the case. You know, we pay a bunch of our developers in USDC. So you could effectively, if they could attest that this is, you know, the wallet where they're getting a wage from and, you know, here's where they make their payments for, say, monthly credit card bills or utility mm. bills, um, you know, that's a world where you could have a, a effectively like a consumer credit score. Do you, do you feel like, um, and, and maybe we can talk a little bit about what I kind of view as like perverse incentives in crypto in general, but especially <laughs> in like the lending market. Like, yeah. you know, you know what's yeah. funny, man, is that uh, so many people view, I think, people who are more skeptical about crypto view our entire space as existing because of central bank malfeasance and debasement of currency. Mm. And basically like, you know, there's this narrative that you guys wouldn't even exist uh, if, if the Fed hadn't pushed everyone so far out on the risk curve. I think crypto, you can make a strong argument that we suffer the most from actually misallocation of capital and misallocation of human capital. Think about just this wave of like retail money and speculation that has rolled over our industry in the last like year. Mm. It's been really hard to make good business decisions, right? Like, I think you mm. probably have some more specific idea about what that means for you. But, I, you know, these conversations I've been having the last couple of months, like, wow, we've really like, if you have an engineering team, and you have all these retail customers asking for these features, and they're gone now, right? Or they were asking you to build on chains that yeah. weren't real, or like, it's a huge distraction, you know? Um, yeah. And my under, my understanding, right, of the, of the lending space, maybe the corollary for you, and you tell me where I'm right or wrong, is that you had a bunch of people that just wanted the highest yield possible. They didn't care about the creditworthiness or the risk that they were taking. So, you know, for lending platforms, the, the CFI one specifically, I think there was a perverse incentive to just, even if I'm going to be responsible, you know, my competitors aren't. I'm at the, I'm at the whim of my stupidest competitor. Isn't that a phrase? Uh, you know, so I think there were just tough incentives. Like, did you... Do you view that from your space? So like walk me through some of the perverse incentives in, in the lending space and like if you view those getting solved or how you're just thinking about building out Maple over the next year or two. Yeah, I think definitely, definitely there was an unsophisticated view on uh, the pricing of risk. And so there was heightened sensitivity to certain kinds of risk and irrationally low sensitivity <laughs> to other kinds of risk. Uh, so right. super heightened sense of, sense of credit risk you know, credit risk around counterparties, um, obviously borne out by play, you know, by people like, uh, or teams like 3AC, um, but more generally probably over, you know, overhyped or, or over feared or overweighted amongst the rest of the players. Like if, you know, if you've been, if you, you know, we had a pool where uh, Alameda was the only borrower, for example. And so obviously very good credit, very systemically important credit um, to the, uh, to the space as a whole. Um, but, People were saying, well, effectively, it's very difficult to price credit risk um, as a whole, so we just can't do over under collateralized lending. So they totally underpriced uh, other risks like smart, you know, depegging risk. So like anchor, effectively, the risk you were bearing was, you know, deep depegging risk um, mm. for the algo stablecoin. People perceived that it was risk free because they were told it was over collateralized and the risk that they dialed up in their head and paid a lot of attention to was counterparty risk. So they're like over collateralized means I can't lose money because if somebody defaults, then we just liquidate them. But if the stable coin itself depegs, that is effectively the protocol defaulting. Um, right. And then uh, the other the other one that's obviously very difficult for people to actually wait or price is smart contract risk. Now people could go in the fork of a fork of a fork and try and get 100% APY, but maybe 100% APY, maybe there was, you know, maybe there was actually quite a high percentage chance of, you know, that fork that was created by people who didn't really have solid developer skills, um, you know, had, a, had a, a, a vulnerability that could be exploited. And so that was seen, you know, that was obviously seen with any number of the over collateralized lending protocols that, that received hacks over the last six or nine months. Um, so anyway, um, to, to kind of get off the soapbox and talk about what, what I think it looks like going forward. Um, I think people are going to be much more discerning. I mean, it's kind of, it's instead of yield. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of the hype and flows of liquidity were driven by yield. Um, if you look back to the kind of the tech wreck, a lot of the flows of liquidity into newly listed tech stocks 
was around um, multiples, not yield, but price to eyeballs multiples. And so people were effectively inflating the number of eyeballs that they said were viewing sites like pets.com. And these weren't underlying viable businesses. But once that happened, the space as a whole developed a callus and an immunity to it. And then they, you know, they, they were much more skeptical of, of that. I think people now are going to be much more skeptical of uh, yield and they're going to be more attuned to what are the counterparty risks and, you know, effectively what risk am I being paid to bear for, for this yield? Do you think um, that we need a heavy, a, a more heavy institutional presence in this space, a more institutional borrower? Because one of one of the things that I find, um, I, I, I love that. kind of walk. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. But I do. I feel like it has to, right? Like I, I, remember, I had these conversations with Jason. Um, you know, when we started to get, like, I started to become a heavier user of DeFi. You know, in within especially in the last like six months, and you know, you've it's, they're very complex products. They're complex financial products. And I kind of using these things, I was like, these are not ultimately designed with retail in mind. You know, I, I like I, I really do think our credit investor laws are, are messed up. I think you should be able to prove your competence via a test or something like that. I think it's unfair to basically cordon off a bunch of the risk and just not let people take it, even if they prove their competence. But the, mm -hmm. the truth, right, is that generally, right, institutions do this for a living. It's their job. They're sophisticated. They'll understand this. And retail, for the most part, won't right so i mean do you see the the composition of the marginal borrower in in crypto shifting you know towards because it seems like we're building products for institutions not for that's what it seems mm. like to me from an outside looking in but i'd be curious if you if, if you see it the same way i think it's often disjointed on both sides of the market like if you look at uh say Aave or compound largely i would say mm. that the the user base is probably on the deposit side um you know, you know, it, it, it's probably still more aside from of you know of arc, which is obviously institutionally focused. I would say it's typically more retail focused in that anyone's depositing. It's probably large, you know, largely comprised of smaller depositors. But institutions aren't really borrowing on the other side, or where they are. You know, I think Three AC had a large um, position on one of those two platforms that ended up uh, getting liquidated or needed to be closed out at a loss, um, but. Most of the, you know, most of the institutions who are operating in the space are not borrowing there. They're going and borrowing from centralized lending desks or from under collateralized or institutionally focused protocols like, you know, like what Maple is doing. Um, right. So I'd say we are, I do see products. I think the problem was actually probably the opposite, that there were products which were fundamentally institutional in nature, but which were actually designed and marketed to the retail market. Like if you look at a lot of the derivatives that were kind of created, the, the flow through them on the buy side was probably more retail and that was incentivized with governance token yields. But the fundamental product is actually one that is targeted at institutions because it's, you know, it's for managing leverage on your portfolios or using for, you know, using it for hedging if you're say a prime right. brokerage. Um, so I think, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's a fair point. And I think what I would expect to come out of it is that over the next six to 12 months, people maybe go back to focusing more on building core products or primitives and then leaving the sexier or the more complex and exotic stuff for later because you know retail is not going to come back to those products anytime soon i don't think yeah i think that's a really good point um my you know i think DeFi, especially is such an interesting space to be playing uh is, mm. is like my kind of mental model for surfing different cycles in crypto is that there's almost like a base layer of things that people accept as working and then we go through a cycle right where we try all these different new ideas right and then we get way ahead of ourselves and it crashes and then we kind of reset yeah. to a lower base layer where like one yeah. or two more things so right like the the thing yeah. that's very different from my perspective in of this bear market and crash versus 2017 and 2018 was Back then, it was like Bitcoin's the only thing that was to even talk about anything other than Bitcoin or maybe like Ethereum was very yeah. unpopular. Your your credibility was called into question, all that kind of stuff. And now, right, we we moved a little bit further along the risk curve. We had and DeFi and NFTs and DAOs, and now we've crashed. But I like DeFi is right in the sweet spot of where like everyone's like, yeah, this is going to be a thing for sure. But it's it's further out on the on the risk spectrum, I think, than than maybe like. Bitcoin as a, as a, as a thing. So I don't know, in, in my personal view of like risk reward, it's gotta be one of the richest areas to be involved in right now, but you are the one who's mm. operating a DeFi protocol. 
you you tell me like how are you viewing your business right now like from an outsiders from my perspectives it looks like it's a pretty cool proof of concept that protocols like maple have withstood tremendous market volatility and are still functioning right so like talk to me about maple's business today like how do you see your your kind of prognosis for the future like uh, do you agree with everything that is? i'm gonna shut up now i ramble on these questions <laughs> but uh, talk to me about how you're thinking about it yeah, I mean, we, we've definitely seen more stress um, than usual coming through the system. I mean, um, we saw in the, you know, in the wake of uh, 3AC, Celsius, um, and, uh, and, and Babel, we saw heightened withdrawals coming through. Mm -hmm. um, but the way, the way that the protocol works is that it relies on loan repayments. So we don't control the withdrawals, but as loans are repaid, people can withdraw. So that at least acts as a bit of a circuit breaker. Um, and has enabled, you know, has enabled the platform to kind of maintain TVL at a relatively high percentage of where it was at its height. Um, and, uh, you know, and it gives, it just gives us time to think through the appropriate changes and then focus on managing operations. So I would say, you know, <laughs> Napoleon had this saying, right, where it's like, you know, military genius is just doing the average thing when everyone else is losing their heads. And what we've tried to focus on over the last couple of weeks is just, you know, working with the pool delegates who, you know, who are the, the uh, managers of the pools on Maple to make sure the loan books are continuing to be serviced, check in on the borrowers, and then do the off-chain stuff of having transparency and calls with lenders and putting out communication that kind of gives people, um, if not 100% certainty, at least clarity on what is going on, what the impacts to them could be. And so it is, uh, I think at, at this point, it is a lot of, it is a lot of off chain work, um, on just, you know, average business operations, keeping up team morale, making sure that you're still continuing to do the core, you know, the core operations of the business, which in Maple's case is lending and, um, you know, managing the servicing of a loan book, the temptation, I think, which is, which is dangerous for a lot of startups is to go and totally redesign everything that they're doing because it's yeah. maximum pessimism so you can you can totally miss the things that are working and think that they are not working and uh instead you know you could have a very good core product and you just need to change a couple of things and so what you should do is you should be instead of panicking and going off and like daydreaming a solution you should try and validate what the core pain points are for people think really carefully come together as a team and then design ways to address those pain points and not try and do everything so don't come up with 10 changes you need to make, but identify the top two or three and then work them through and then, you know, develop your upgrade whilst continuing to run your business at the same time. So I think that's, that's what we've tried to focus on. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and not getting too doom and gloom about the entirety of the, of the space. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, and to maybe bring it full circle, we were talking about there being a lender of last resort. The The real reason yeah. why we want to avoid that type of deus ex machina is it causes this thing, right? Like um, moral moral hazard, right? Uh, and and yeah. that's, the, that's the idea. Like to, you know, all, all of the businesses that, that make it through this current time, they will be that much more resilient. And because they don't have that safety net, they in theory will be more prudent right the next time that this all yeah. this all rolls around and a good yeah I, I think just double clicking on your point there which is a very good one um, a good you know a, a good analogy is was protectionism so you know early on like in the mercantile industry you had a lot of people advocating that um, we needed to protect you needed to protect domestic industries from um, foreign ones and you would do that by you know putting in place tariffs. Now, in some cases, tariffs on foreign goods can be sensible, like where you have IP theft, you know, notably over the, over the last couple of years. Uh, but in an ordinary sense, that protectionism weakens your industries. It makes the organizations less resilient to withstanding shocks and difficulties. And just fundamentally, they're not match fit. Like they're slow, they're bloated, um, they don't make good decisions, and they don't prudently manage risk because they can count on the, you know, on the Bernanke put effectively or you know maybe it's the bankman fried put nowadays but um uh yeah i th I, th I think you i think you would ne you need to allow um organizations and sectors to evolve their own ways of mitigating risk or, or withstanding shocks okay now that you brought it up I, I actually i was meaning to ask you about this the the bankman fried put or whatever um but you know for for listeners uh, you've probably seen these stories right but um 
you know, uh, Sam, you know, the founder of Alameda and FTX, I'm, I'm pretty sure Sam isn't involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, of Alameda anymore, but that's the prop trading firm. Uh, and then there's FTX, the derivatives exchange, and now they're expanding into all these different areas. But, uh, you know, there have essentially been these, you know, these kind of bailouts, right? So there was a $250 million mm -hmm. line of credit uh, that got extended to BlockFi with, you know, rumors. I haven't seen the agreement myself, but some pretty some pretty aggressive uh, terms, right? If if uh, if repayment can't be made, um, there was a, a similar line of credit or, or loan that was extended to Voyager that basically patched their their three arrows exposure. Um, and there are comparisons being made because we're doing a lot of historical <laughs> comparisons uh, on this show of uh, J.P. Morgan, right? Uh, who is kind of like the lender of last resort before we had yeah. the Fed. So, I guess yeah. I mean I, I don't know if you have special knowledge of these deals or whatever, but I'd be curious to get your perspective. Like, do you do you think that what Sam's do, is doing is enough to like uh, you know, kind of stem the bleeding and shore up confidence in the space? Do you view it as as potentially like a trade-off, right? Um, it, like maybe we don't want that lender of last resort or, or don't need it. Mm -hmm. Like what's your kind of take on the activity uh, from on Sam's mm -hmm. front? Yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it is a good analogy in, in comparison to, you know, what JP Morgan did back in like 1907. And also more recent, like a, a pretty good more recent example is what Warren Buffett and Berkshire did for Goldman's and um, in, uh, yeah, B of, B of A ba back Bank in of America, 2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. back in uh, back during the GFC, he effectively provided you know high yield debt to them to 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 patch up the balance sheet, and then also took warrants in the in the business. Um, and but that solved the problem of uh, you know patching up their balance sheet health, giving them the liquidity they needed to get through a volatile period, and you know effectively help them, you know, help them withstand that shock. And I think so in the short term, what Sam's doing is, uh, is definitely healthy um, for the system. It's promoting stability. Um, it has a calming effect on the markets. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it is like something that's, that's needed by those businesses at the moment, and it restores confidence. Um, in the longer term, I think the question is, is this healthy for the space structurally? And so you'd need to look at those businesses. Like, in each case, those CFI, those CFI lending businesses have at call deposits. So they have a fundamental asset liability mismatch. Um, they try and manage that through having, you know, uh, open term loans, which they can call instantly. Um, but uh, unless they fundamentally decide to shift business and ha say have more term deposits, they're going to require that backstop liquidity. Um, do I think something similar could be applied to DeFi? Uh, no, and I think it's healthier for DeFi to ultimately try and opt for a change in the way that protocols or mechanisms are designed so that it can withstand those liquidity shocks. And so that it avoids a situation of market consolidation where you have too big to, you know, the necessity of a lender of last resort and too big to fail um, uh, participants. And I think that, you know, I think that's done and it is quite effectively mitigated by having transparency on chain of who's, you know, who's borrowing what the reserve levels are, um, what the cash levels are um, amongst lenders, as well as you know having a equity or first loss reserve in place, mm. and as well as having um, automation or a lack of restrictions over um, or a lack of discretion over the ability to like you know pause withdrawals, as well as also the other thing is transparency that users know their funds are not being like punted into illiquid trades, yield farming, um, or, you know, lodged in, in like super liquid assets. Um, I think it's healthy when you know that if you're putting money into a lending platform, that that platform is only doing lending and, you know, where you can see right. the health of its reserves and quality of its book at all times. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of a long winded answer. So I think in the short term and particularly for CFI, it is, it is healthy in the longer term. Does it make a system that's more for fragile? Um, probably. And, and that's a situation that I would want to avoid. Yeah, I think these these situations are tough, um, and there's a lot of nuance. Like even all of the CFI lenders being lumped into one business, uh, you know, without naming any. Spe well, there's one obviously that's uh, legal action or whatever being taken, but uh, you know, I think there there were differences, right, in terms of what's causing stress. I think some of these were well-run yeah. businesses um, that uh, you know, frankly, got had a bit of a bad got dealt a bit of a bad hand. You could say they they should have known whatever about three arrows, but you know everyone kind of fell for the same trick there. Uh, and then there were others that were taking undue risk probably. So that there's a whole spectrum. And then also to just say, to add one more historical comparison, I mean, there's another guy who bails uh, out funds or financial businesses, uh, Ken Griffin. Uh, he's, uh, mm -hmm. Mike, I think Mark Yusko is telling this story on the Roundup last week, but uh, Ken 
titan of industry, very sharp guy, uh, but it, he also has bailed out numerous hedge funds. Uh, but again, with some pretty arduous terms, I think, behind them as well. And um, mm -hmm. and there's also a little something to be said for, I'm not saying this is Sam at all, and I, I honestly, like, I appreciate what he's doing for the space, my personal opinion, but there is something to having a financial business with open trades and kind of opening that up to someone who also trades and having the bailout come from the same person. So there are all these fun nuances and, and um, you know, weird things. We'll, we'll see how it eventually ends up playing out, right? Yeah. Uh, I have yeah. no crystal ball. Um, I was just going to say, I mean, it is like, it is a naturally sort of healthy part of, um, you know, of, of a developed like capitalist market, right? Like in, in the regular economy, private equity functions largely the same way. They would buy out distressed businesses where there is a, there is a salvage value in the business or recapitalize the business. It comes at kind of extractive terms, but that's because they have, you know, the, the expertise to recapitalize and identify what risk they're taking in those situations. But that's where the cost, you know, effectively it's lower cost to recapitalize a business than to allow it to fail and go and set up a set up and build a new one and more profitable to do so. And I think, you know, it's 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 uh, it's wasteful if every time a business experiences difficulty, we let the whole business fail and then say go start another one. Like I think it's um, it's good to to patch up businesses yeah. that are otherwise sound um, yeah. if uh, if they just need a bit of extra capital and they already have personnel in place, systems, technology, customer relationships. Yeah. Um, so maybe just to close things out, because I know we're drawing towards the end of our time here. Um, you know, uh, again, to go back to like 2018 and, and 2019, that bear market kind of bore out some of these uh, kind of more more centralized, maybe more CFI, uh, but but good capital markets infrastructure. And one trend mm -hmm. that that I'm starting to see and notice is that during during this period of, of rebuilding, it seems like there's more of a focus uh, of building on chain infrastructure as opposed to off-chain infrastructure. So like, A, do you agree with that? Do you think that out of this next bear market, right, where you see more discipline yeah. among builders and allocators, that there's going to be more of a focus towards building things on chain? And if so, you've kind of been tangentially talk about it, uh, but I maybe yeah. reiterate just for the listeners, what exactly the benefits are of an on-chain uh, kind of financing business as opposed to uh, one that's off-chain. 100%. Like if, if I just, so if I wanted to rebuild Maple off-chain, so CFI Maple, or if I wanted to go mm -hmm. and rebuild uh, BlockFi or, or Genesis or one of, one of these CFI lending businesses. So um, I have to go and create a lot, a significant amount of infrastructure. And the same if I wanted to go and build a centralized exchange. You have to build, whereas on-chain, I can take advantage of all of the wallet addresses that exist, as well as the code which governs smart contracts to do what we did with Maple, which was with a pretty lean team, I think we had about 12 people by the time that we actually got to market and we'd probably spent less than $2 million actually developing the product at which we, we'd taken to launch versus, and that, that was something with the capacity to set up a pool, take in deposits, route those deposits out to fund loans to borrowers, um, send borrowers, you know, let borrowers know what their repayment obligations were, take them back into the pool and then pass those through to, uh, to lenders and have an inbuilt reserve. So that's everything that I was able to, to leverage um, the on-chain infrastructure for. If I wanted to build an off-chain version of that business, I have to have a wallet that takes, you know, takes in deposits, but then once they come in there, I then have to have very complex internal ledgers and databases governing who owns what amount of money once it's come into that wallet. Because I just take everyone's money into the same wallet, and then I say, okay, Mike owns, you know, Mike has $1 million deposited, Depositor number two has $2 million. Uh, we lent out both of those amounts to this borrower. And then that borrower paid, you know, 8% interest. I'm governing that all on the back end on either spreadsheets or internal databases. And so I can't leverage the security at all of on-chain. If that database goes down, were there prudent backups? Like that's that's all of the cost that goes into running that business off-chain. So I actually think it just fundamentally makes more sense to build it on-chain. Yeah. I, I would have to agree with you. And I think, honestly, um, guys, if you're in, in the crypto space, uh, there's obviously no guaranteeing anything. But these bear markets, while sometimes they're a little bit more heightened adrenaline, uh, I promise you, yeah. more interesting things happen at the end of the day. And great businesses, new ideas, innovation comes from it. And I think Maple's a great example of that. Sid, uh, if folks want to find out more about you, the team, the work that you're doing at Maple, what's the best way to follow you, get more information? Yeah, sure. So you can either go to our website, which is maple.finance. That's where we have access to the web app, news about what's going on. 
with us, or you can go to our Twitter page, which is maple at Maple Finance, one word, and then I'm at Syrup Sid, uh, also one word. But that's where we're trying to publish, you know, pretty regular updates on what's going on, uh, and it's where most of the people, you know, crypto Twitter is ultimately where a lot of people are getting their news. But anyway, that's the best way. Syrup Sid, that's a pancake thing, yeah. Maple. Yeah, yeah, syrup, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Dude, awesome. All right, Sid, thanks so much for coming on, man. This has been a great episode. We'll have to do it again sometime soon. Awesome, Mike. Thanks for having me.